Woman Up podcast speaks to and about women and non-binary artists, as well as academics, writers, activists, midwives, carers and more. Those challenging ideas and ideals, questioning assumptions and provoking social change. It's a podcast dedicated to creating a living archive of these people and this work that anyone can access. We find those trying to change current structures founded on bias. Those working intersectionally, across gender, race, sexuality, disability, as well as having caring responsibilities. We have conversations about lived experiences, achievements and aspirations, as well as fantastic artwork. In 2023, for Series 5, we received a National Lottery Project grant from Arts Council England to take the podcast on tour. I'm your host, Susan Merrick, and today's episode is our last one for the Woman Up 2023 tour. This episode was recorded at the Women in Revolt exhibition at Tate Britain with my co-producer Amy Dignam. We were lucky enough to meet up with one of the artists um, exhibiting in the exhibition, Rosie Martin, who's a fantastic photographer, artist and writer. The format of this episode is slightly different to usual. We had a wonderful conversation across the morning with Rosie, um, including her showing us the work she's got in the exhibition. We've shared some of this conversation with you and really hope you enjoy it. Rosie is a photographer, an artist and a writer who's been working since the 1970s. Um, Rosie quite famously uh, collaborated with Joe Spence um, and the work that they created together formed the phototherapy reenactment series that Joe Spence is famous for. Um, We're really excited to talk to Rosie. We are here in uh, Tate Britain outside the Women in Revolt exhibition um, and even more excited to be sat here talking to Rosie Martin who is going to very kindly show us some of the exhibition and have a talk to us about um, her amazing work and practice. Hi Rosie. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> is it okay if I take f- uh, videos, short videos and photos for social media? Are you happy with that? Or do you prefer yeah, it's fine. Work? Yeah? Uh, I don't have a very good social media presence because I can't be bothered with it. You know, I write shit, but then I've got to to write it again. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm not the world's typist. I was very clear when I was young not to be, not to learn to type because in those days that's what women did. Really? So you were So you said no thanks? I decided not to, but of course I wish I had now. (laughs) But I'd, I'd finished a master's in industrial design and one of the bloody guys, because they were all guys, of course, it was, I was the only woman in the department, sort of said, oh, you could be a secretary in someone's office. And I thought, I've just done an MA in this subject, and now you're telling me I could be a secretary? I was, uh, I could, spitting teeth, as I put it nowadays, I was, I just went, hmm, mm. glared a bit. I'm not surprised. Well, I mean, they wouldn't say that to the blokes. And I just thought, what have I been doing all this for? You know, you get very that's angry. That assumption, wasn't that? That, that's what well, that was 81. You know, we're talking almost just about when feminism started. So, I mean, that's why people say, why are you a feminist? I just say, well, it described my life. And the frustrations that I'd experienced. So, it's never any question. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> When you see someone, oh, yeah, you're going tick, tick, yeah, tick, tick, you know, it just all falls into place and you think, yes, good, there's a theory that explains my frustrations and, yeah, I mean, belittling actually is the word. Because mm. if I was good enough to do that MA, why do they think all I can be as a secretary? You might as well have told me not to bother at the beginning. God, I was cross. So what happened after that? Um, while I was doing design for disabled children, um, because I wanted to do something worthwhile, I was designed for the real world, Victor Papanak and all the work that was being done, taking design solutions to what we call the third world in those days, and I wanted to do something that was worthwhile, because I was paying my way through that course, so I didn't want to just you know, design a better TV or something. But I persisted in trying to do it, but I couldn't get any funding. And then I did a oh, further research work, but it was just very, very hard. 
and um, I used to talk about the, the people in fur coats. It was a kind of charity attitude towards disabled children in those days. It wasn't really seeing them as worth investing in properly. No, it was about what those people looked like who were doing the help. Yeah, being, that's right. Well, all that class thing, you know, like those, mid, those middle-class women who went into the East End and improved the life of poor women. I mean, it's good that they did the work, but it's very much looking down. Again, this looking down thing. And I wanted to treat people as equals. And that's always been my politics, I suppose. So, so being on the same level rather than this kind of, you know... Yeah, I've got a fur coat and I've got a posh car. No, no, I'm doing work with these people, you know, not doing charity. And I'm doing work to make their lives better, not dripping a bit of money in, because it makes me feel good. Is that, <sighs> do you think, why you wanted I'm, also to, when you'd done the phototherapy work, you wanted to qualify as a therapist so that you could work on that? Yeah, so I could actually... Again, um, like, that's right, because obviously if I was going to start running workshops and work with people, I had to have the competence. When we were working with Joe, we were discovering things as we went along, you know, and we could make mistakes in the safety of a collaborative relationship and talk about, well, that didn't work well or that worked really well. And it was um, research, let's face it. We were finding out something new. But when you go to share that with other people, you have to be pretty confident of your skills. You have to know that you can hold a group. You have to know that if someone is really difficult or really needy, uh, either overly demanding or just falling apart, you have to be able to hold that. Yeah, that's nice. And keep yourself safe as well as... you never know what comes up during this Well, sessions. especially with this work. I mean, people exactly. would declare share being abused as children who'd never talked about it before. I mean, it was so self-revelatory and so powerful, but obviously I had to be able to, well, build a group that could support everybody. That's also really important, so everyone feels safe. And then, you know, allow the space and the time for people to talk about trauma, basically. So you have to have therapy skills to do that. You can't just wander in and think, oh, I'd like to help. Absolutely. Oh, I'd like to help. Yes, we'd all like to help, but you need some skills to do that, yeah. actually. I've had people approach me and suggest that I run workshops in that kind of way, and when I, I've had to say, well, I'm very happy to work with a group of women, but you'll have to provide the people who have the, the skills and expertise to deal with anything safeguarding and I'm, saying, I'm right. not a therapist I'm not yeah. a, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist yes. and I love working with groups and working but not in the sense of therapy so it's like if you if, if there is any risk and there often is of and there always is exactly if you make it safe enough I yeah. mean it's part of the then you have to make sure you've got people in the room who can provide that safety ongoing as well yeah and I think also when you use um, visual media in any form, okay, I'm using photography and performance, but even when you're using art therapy kind of mark making stuff, people things come up that you wouldn't that don't maybe wouldn't come up in just conversation. People go deeper. And they don't always realise until they see what they've done. And then you've got the issue of holding it. Keeping it safe. I mean I always also give people that you know lists of therapy they can therapists and places they can go afterwards again because what happens in my workshops is it opens up a lot and I can't close everything down completely as much as I try to so I always provide you know contacts for further work if that's what people want so I, I'm exceedingly responsible in my practice because you just have to be really you can't just wander in and, you know, let's open up some... Let's have a bit of trauma today. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, it's irresponsible. And it's quite tricky because, you know, I'm, I'm doing this sort of artist-therapist bit. So, you know, who am I? Which, which area do I belong in is often problematic, actually. Do you find people want to put you in a box? Well, the world lives in boxes, doesn't it? And also when I write, you know, do I publish in therapy books or art books or photography? So 
It has a slightly different emphasis depending on where it's being placed and what audience I'm talking to. So yeah, that's a bit tricky. It's all that collaborative collective style of working, which obviously I was immersed in, which this exhibition is about really. It's about women working for change in inverted commas, but you know, it's, it's very much activism focused. And I'm really excited to see the exhibition, um, but it would also be good to hear about the work that you've done since this period, which is a long time a ago. Long time ago. <laughs> yeah. um, Very long time so there's, ago. There's a lot more work in your practice, um, and Amy and I have both been really interested in the work that you did around grief and pre-bereavement. Is that the term you use? Yeah. yeah. And yes, we, it we is. We both recognise that because we've both um, been around sick parents who lost. I mean my mum's dementia was the hardest thing. How long did she live with it for? Um, well it depends how one defines the beginnings of dementia really. Uh, five years I suppose but it was really after she had her knee operation that she didn't ever really come back. She'd say where am I when she got home okay. and I thought oh that's not good. Because she lived in that place for 70 years. You know, it wasn't like she was going to some home or something. It was her home. And she was saying, where am I? Shit. Sweetie, this is the Thames. You know, it was, that was a bit worrying. And then it just went downhill after that. My mum's asked me to keep an eye on her memory. She's really frightened of um, dementia. She's got a lot of friends who um, she's seen either going to care homes or she's still supporting herself. Yes. Um, and she and I actually did a memory test together. On She allowed it for a video. We did it during COVID, I think. We report, we were on, um, it must have been a, I don't know if it was a Zoom call or a, it was a video call that we managed to set up together. And, yeah. um, and she said, let's let's do a memory test. So we, we did it. And she was fine, but she almost said, you know, let's do that occasionally. You know, can you keep an eye on things? because I obviously don't know what I'm remembering and what I'm not. Um, well, so she yeah, sounds very sus, actually. Yeah, it, but it is a fear, it's a fear for her and it's a fear for me. But yeah, my mum was very funny. I remember she was, they said, who's the Prime Minister? I think it was, she said, oh, Tony Blair, but then what's happened to the Labour Party? I thought, good on you, mate. <laughs> You know, in some ways, it, it, was a la it was a lapsing memory. She could be very funny at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And that's the joy you have to hang on to. Yeah. Did those inspire, did those times inspire the images of the close-ups in your family home? Well, um, because I was going home to look after her a lot, I thought I'll make a project out of it, because that's, you know. But also, after my father died, I was very aware that sort of everything I touched everywhere I looked was something he'd made so it started as a, to honour him and then it became about being with her so it went through a number of mutations really because I was also interested in, because it was my childhood home in looking at the, the child view of it but also of me as the carer view of it so it's multiple really so um, and it was small, it was just a semi-detached house on the edge of London, I mean it wasn't anything special but my dad had made it really beautiful but of course it was wearing out so there's all that kind of sort of multiplicity it's beautiful but it's worn you can see the wear and tear you can see the time, you can see also you know, the style because um, there was this Tudor style dining room and I thought that was special. And then when I did the research, I found out that that was very fashionable in the 1930s when they got the house. Okay. And I also discovered that he'd made it so cleverly. He got, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, not laminate. Um, what's the thin bit of wood you stick on wood? I can't remember what it's called uh, now. Veneer. Veneer, yes. He got veneer and straps of bits of wood that he'd found and he'd made it that way and then um, French polished it so it looked like yeah. a proper um, you know, wooden panelled room but it was actually a piece of theatre.
brilliant. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it was also that desperate wish to hold on to things, knowing that they're yeah. going to go. And I mean, that was why I called it pre-bereavement, because, you know, I knew mum wasn't... You know, she wasn't going to live forever and I was going to lose the, the house would, would go and, I'd ha and that was really hard and so I spent a long time after she died taking photographs in the house as well but it has a very different feel they're much more um, I sort of said photographing through my tears really they're, they are sad and they are kind of out of focus and they are a bit blurry and it, I was yeah, I mean, I was feeling that, but actually what was interesting was the images were like that as well. So there was something about the state of mind that I was photographing in that you could see in the images. So they, they are different from the original ones when Mum was there, because, you know, it was like I was recording the house and all those things, but but she was safely downstairs going... Um, but, you know, she was there, so that was sort of OK, but once they'd gone, that was... Ugh. But I've written a lot about that. It's beautiful, beautiful essays. Um, but uh, if you're into that, look at Bachelard's Poetics of Space. He's got a beautiful chapter about how you um, imagine your childhood home, which should really touch you, I think, given what you've said. And it is the poetics of space because you know it's kind of it's odd in a way. I read it when I was at uni. Oh, you did. Yeah. Good. Amazing. Because it is that whole thing about was it the tiniest the memory of the tiniest latch remains in your hands, and that's kind of that you do have a sort of bodily memory as well. Because we talk a lot about the visual, but we also do have um, essential memories, like the touch of things. And I always say I shop with my hands. Yeah. Um, because you know, because I'm always about touch, and then the things in my parents' house were all very beautiful because my they managed to get lovely things. My dad was like that. Um, he was a tailor by profession, but he was also really good at making almost anything. So it's that kind of and quality stuff. <laughs> oh yes, quality stuff. What got you into photography? Oh, well, I did photography when I did foundation, and I loved it. But in those days, it wasn't this sort of wonderfully theoretical space. It was just take pictures. And then I, inst I was thinking I might do photography, but then I did industrial design instead because I thought with my science background that would be appropriate. I still had this notion that I should earn money. Yeah. That you needed an income. Yeah, well, my dad always said, don't be an artist, there's no money. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> he was right. So, you know, I did chemistry because that would lead to a job. And then I did industrial design with the notion that that would lead to a job rather than doing something that was going to be purely artistic. But obviously that's what I wanted to do, so eventually I ended up there. Yeah. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I mean, in a way, it might have been easier to do it at the beginning, mightn't it? Might have saved some time. Maybe. <laughs> but maybe, yeah, I mean, your experiences are what get you to where you are, aren't they? So. Yes, and you're, in my case, very meandering pathway is, is how I got here. So, I mean, I can draw upon different skills because I got these different skills. And maybe if I'd done a straight line, you know, like done photography, worked in the industry, probably have had to have been advertising or some crap like that. So I might have been highly skilled, but I wouldn't have had all those other uh, intellectual inputs. Yeah. Who knows? Anyway. When did you realise that phototherapy was a thing to develop and to to carry on. Yeah, that's true. Quite quickly, actually. Partly because Joe was quite... Joe was well-connected with um, women in, say, Feminist Review was the first essay that we wrote. Um, when did we realise? I think it was when I did the work on Becoming My Mum, which was really early on, when Joe went, God, these are fantastic. 
And also, right, the very first session that we had, Joe did of something with the bridal um, the veil. veil. And then she worked that up in, in another session. And she said, yes, you know, this is kind of working. This is really saying something. And so it went from just playing around and dressing up to being really saying something important. So it was sort of realising that we'd come up with something exciting. Um, but we, you know, we came up from through co-counselling. We we'd done all this work, listening to each other's stories in depth and feeding back and being supportive. And then there was one session, and Joe was talking about how she was playing so many different roles in her life. It was all about these multiple hats, multiple roles that we had. And, and I was saying, well, yes, one day I'm a lecturer another day I'm you know just learning how to do things and I've got these multiple hats as well and so it seemed um oh yes right and I also had a house full of clothes because I love clothes but (laughs) having um having decided well having switched to be a lesbian I couldn't wear all my pretty dresses because they were all too femme can I ask so I look um, I watched a film where you said I chose to become a lesbian and you just used similar language then and I'm interested in that in that language as in Well I was heterosexual when I was younger. Yeah, so was it did it feel like a political decision for you as well as a sexual one? Yeah. That again was very much the times. So I was spending all my time with women, you know, where everything I was doing was women based, you know, and it suddenly it's like, well, you know, I'm got no time for these other creatures so you know and then you sort of think mm, like them. so yeah it was, it was almost like I'd, I'd sort of shut my my social life down to being all women and everybody I listened to and respected was women so it's like well why would I go outside of that and also I was fed up with blokes and it's almost a realization yeah well, but it took a while to realize yeah that I mean I really made that shift so it was a choice and I mean I think Nowadays it's slightly different because it's sort of more seen as more of an option. Whereas in those days it was a quite a, a step outside the norm, whatever the norm was. It was a lot stricter. Definitely was. So you found a group of people you got on with that happened to be women, that happened to be lesbians, and oh yeah, I'll be there then because that's my space. But. Um, so playing with the clothing and you wanted to be less femme, did you say, in terms of... Well, no, I had to be because, you know, that's uh, if you look at the work, the alter ego is the, the check shirt with all the badges <laughs> telling you what to do. That was a bit what it was like then. Yeah. And um, I did wear my dad's trousers all the time because they're really lovely tweed trousers, you know, because he was a tailor, gorgeous clothes. But, you know, I was quite happy wearing those. But um, And I'd been wearing those for ages, you know, but it was like, I can't wear dresses anymore. And I had cupboards full of beautiful dresses that I'd made in Liberty Silk. And I can't wear these anymore. They're too firm. Did Give you out keep the wrong. Yes, of course I can. Good. <laughs> Can't get into them anymore, but I sort of take them out. Look, I lined it. Look how I felt that. You know, because they're so beautiful. An incredible skill as well, dressmaker. You're going to have to see those dresses, you know that. Yeah. You're going to have to send us <laughs> yeah. a picture. Well, you've got to feel them. It's just all about We need to visit and feel the dresses. Yeah, we can come and try them out. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I like 30s shapes. All, this, all that cut on the bias gorgeous but now if you cut something on the bias you see my belly which you know was famously on show at uh, London photo London my huge belly was uh, enlarged but you know it's not really what you want to show off is it I was talking to a friend yesterday actually who is um She's an artist who normally works with textiles and wool, mm. and she's um, making a project at the moment around the wild swimming she's been doing. Oh, for wonderful! Her um, yes, so she's just into her fifties, and she's like really finding the health benefits. But she's wanting to photograph bits, but she's never really photographed her body before. Yeah, and um, she says she's trying, and every time she's doing a bit, she's like, "Oh, no, I can't do it," you know. I think she's managed her feet and like some of the skin on her oh, legs. Oh, well, uh, look at tell her to look at outrageous ages because I started that in my fifties. Okay. And mm. I didn't. I'd never shown my naked body before. 
but um, Kay, Kay Goodridge and I did this project, quite a long-term research project, but we did this crazy um, striptease, which is available on Vimeo. Brilliant. <coughs> so I've seen the images with the text on the body. Oh yes, they're great. Yeah, they're yeah. really good. I haven't seen the striptease, I will now have to look at that. You will. Unfortunately, it's kind of quite low quality now because it was, well, whatever. It's made a long time ago. Um, but there's no... I can't, we can't do it now. Kay wouldn't do it now anywhere, no. But, I mean, also our bodies aren't... But it's very funny. Yeah, I will look that up. We'll, we'll find a link, actually, if that's OK, and put it on the bottom of the episode. <laughs> well, I mean... Or would you rather people just search for it? No, it's fine, but, I mean... Um, definitely put my Vimeo link on the end because there's quite a lot of different videos there. Okay, great. And that's fine, yeah. I mean, yeah. I was just thinking of that for this woman who was having... Yeah. It's not to say that's going to... Well... You've got to get beyond... You've got to get a long way beyond looking for any kind of ideal or perfect body. That's the whole thing about that project, really. Um... I just love the body you've got. I'm going to pause this a challenge, of course it is. And um, that's. I think people share and show too quickly now, and that's very much this um, toy problem. Because when. Rosie's just tapping on her smartphone. Then. Well, yeah, I call it a toy. Because, um, you know, when Joe and I were making work, we took time before we, we showed it. We sort of dealt with the emotions that came up. And in fact, like the work, um, The Day in the Life of a Schoolgirl, circa 1962, that was on at Photographer's Gallery, which is a great piece of work, but I'm not sure I was completely separate from it. And when it got really rubbish reviews, they, they hurt. Mm. Okay. So, I mean, in a way, when you put work out in public you, you don't want to be too attached to it you need to have separated from it so that if someone says you know that shit you don't think I'm shit yeah. and that would again be what I would suggest to this friend of yours that if she's doing this and going it's like no that, that's not helping her it really isn't helping at all um, she needs to find other routes into that and then eventually, I mean, because, you know, we did all this thing about photographing, Kay and I, photographing um, bits of our bodies that we, we thought were problematic, like double chins and stuff. But we, uh, we overlapped the photographs and then had them as a huge freeze. And they were just beautiful, these bits of bodies, when you're not sort of so aware of, oh, God, you know, I've got a fat belly, but it just became lyrical and beautiful. But it took a long time to get there. You don't go just like that. It's it's not. And it was a curator actually who said, "Why don't we put them all together?" Ah, oh, it's a freeze. It really worked because you're not so aware of the individual, you know, fat belly. You're thinking, "Oh, that's a beautiful shape." It becomes like landscapes. Yes, yeah. landscapes. Absolutely, body as landscape. That's what that work is, and that's what I call the belly work as well. Body as landscape, and this, you know, the. Um, do I, how do I explain this one on the sound? Um, Rosie's holding her fingers to her face and almost acting like a facelift with her fingers. Yeah, that's right, the poor girl's facelift. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be a high ponytail, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, if you, if you do this, what do they call it? The um, Croydon facelift, oh, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> Is there any of your work that you would repeat? these days any of your work in, that you've done in the past that you would like to revisit oh, that's interesting um, well in a way I'm working on ageing now with Verity Verity Wellstead and so that's a I know Verity she's one of the desperate housewives oh, really? she had an exhibition with us a oh, long I didn't time know ago you Verity. yeah she's great yeah she's lovely lovely yeah yeah, I, I saw some work she did where she was for, forcing herself into her teenage clothes. Yes. <laughs> She'll be fun. Mm -hmm. thought, She's not worried, That's you know, because, yeah, you know, you have, I need to work with people who are not self-conscious, obviously, and are willing to make fun of, you know, to play, to play basically. Yeah. So I thought, well, she'll be good. So I said, oh, would you like to work with me? And she said, yeah. So that's how it happened. It was just because I could see from her work and how she was that she'd be fun to play with. Yeah. 
yeah, it's going really well. So yes, I am revisiting that in a way. Obviously, from 20 years on, which is a bit odd. We're not redoing the work, not as in you know. But we're looking at ageing, which obviously means it's covering similar area. Only I'm 20 years older. That feels like a very appropriate piece of work to revisit. Well, it happens, doesn't it? You do get yeah, older. Exactly. <laughs> when um, you're 50, you think you're ancient. When you're 70, you really are. Rosie, back then, back in the days when you were doing this work, would you ever imagined this today? Women in revolt, 2023. No, but I mean, we just did work. I mean, photography wasn't in the tape for a start. Um, well, there's no reason why it shouldn't be here, but it was a bit like, I think it's been forgotten. I think that's the problem. I think when we were making work, then you were getting it out and there were more photography galleries in those days. So you could show work, albeit somewhere that maybe no one would know. You know, the CV, no one would know most of those galleries, but you know, they did exist. There was somewhere to show work. So it was, but it wasn't art in that sense. It was, it was photography. It was saying something. It was about having a conversation with people. Um, but in that sense, I suppose it was quite marginalised. No, I wouldn't. But tape was for paintings, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And sculpture. Oh, sorry, and sculpture. Tut, sculpture, tut. yes. But, you know, for men. tape was Turner men. and blokes, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> men, men, men. <laughs> oh, I forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, old male artists, that's what it was about. Old or dead male artists, so no. But I mean, this is quite strange for Tate anyway. I mean, they haven't done it before, have they? No. Whether they'll do it again, I don't know. I know Lindsay's keen to do more. So we have to keep well, her encouraged. Lot, there's a lot more to look at, isn't there? Because this is 1970s to 1990. 1990. Yeah, so you could do, yeah, 90 to 2000, couldn't yeah. you? Yeah. Easy. Yeah. But this particular lot has been forgotten big time. Okay. It's really good to have that focus. At this point in the conversation, Rosie took Amy and I into the Women in Revolt exhibition. For some of the um, conversation, you can hear screaming. This is um, work by Gina Birch called Three Minute Scream. Um, so that's uh, some of the background noise that you can hear. Um, Rosie introduces us to some of Joe Spence's work, being um, a major collaborator with Joe, um, and introduces her work. And she also introduces two of her pieces of work that are in the exhibition. As we walked around the exhibition, we mentioned the fact that some of the artists had stopped making work or had maybe taken long breaks. Um, and Amy and I liked Rosie's response. And so we asked her to say it again so we could record it. God, what did I say? You've just got to be stubborn. Um, and, you know, some of my friends saying, what are you doing? What are you wasting your time on? And I just kept plodding on and doing it. It was without recognition, without getting work on walls that's the hard thing if you never ever get to show stuff and you're working on projects and then you have to let go of them and start another one because if you really want to show and you don't get it out there it's quite hard to let go of that project yeah. like all the death work you've been talking about I never got to show that and the housework mm. I showed bits and pieces, but as I said, through working in groups. In fact, with Gina, who we just met, um, we were a group, and um, we got one of those tiny grants to be able to make an exhibition. So that's how I got that work out. Yeah. But having to duck and dive all the time with that tenacity. Yeah. Like Gina, who we just met, she's still making work. I'm still making work. But a lot of people, they just go, what? You know? Yeah. Yeah, there'll be a lot of people and work here who people get have lost on the way or stopped for a period of time yes a lot of a lot of yeah. the women in, in this show have had to have do something else to pay the rent yeah well, they probably as many all of us, had to as many of us do 
This is Joe Spencer's work, Beyond the Family Album, that was shown at the Hayward Gallery in 1978. And um, in this year, Joe is critiquing and dissecting the family album and showing, in a way, how little there is in it. Oh, it's, a very, it's a very intellectual piece, actually. It needs to be read. Um, it's very clever, but the whole point was when we started to work together, we used this idea of almost the family album not saying very much and then sort of opened it up through our performative work um, based on co-counselling, based on knowing the story behind the picture to, in a sense, expand the meaning of, of the family album as as often collected and in those days despised, actually. I mean, this was a very radical intervention. What's she, what she doing putting those images on the wall? You know, Because they were seen as totally unimportant. I know a lot of people use the family album as inspiration they work now, but back then it just wasn't, it was completely disregarded. Too personal. Too personal, that's my, um, it's going to be on my gravestone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I miss him, my work was, yeah. they, they said, no, we're not showing that, it's too personal. Yep. Isn't it incredible? It's almost like when I th now that you were talking, it just made me think about how well curated our family albums are. Oh, by our mums. By our mums, by our parents. Usually, I mean, very they're well very selected. Curated. Yeah, yeah. Because it is, it is like a sort of form of social media, you know, what you put on Instagram, what, they, what you want to show. No, you put show. much it's more like on Instagram. Much more, but it's always curated. It's like that picture that you want to show, that things that True. you want to see. I mean, um, I think in the in the eighties in our family it was about well you had one roll of film. Yes, right. When and that roll that's of it film, for the holiday. So yeah, for so the you, whole holiday. So like this this <laughs> moment we will photograph this moment because yeah. we've only got twenty four photos. That's right. <laughs> so we have to curate our lives. And yeah. go that camera. True. No, we don't that's think true. we do. We're so, much more disciplined. I, I mean, the thing is, actually, basically, people thought before they took a picture. Well, that's I think you go, And now it's like, let's take a photo. Does they yeah. need to find the camera and set it yeah, up? Yeah, 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 and set it up, okay, and create a... Yeah, but you can never get everyone to smile at the same time anyway, no. not even when you've got a digi. And you still get, get a hundred, you won't get one that's good. My mum always cut people's heads off. <gasps> it was... She could never I'm the, the, always the one with the eyes closed. Oh, yes, eyes closed. That's what I do a lot. But also, um, even if you take... Even with a digital camera, you take you know, a group of ten, you'll never find one where everyone's happy. Uh, no. Yeah. Even with loads of pictures. No, with no. Someone, oh, no. Um, a couple of times I've done that as a joke. Yeah. yeah. And sent, like, on, on a social media. I think I've done it once, actually. I just was like, here are the 24 photos it took to yeah. get all my nephews and nieces to have their eyes open <laughs> and be looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I suppose, I suppose we're more conscious in a way. Conscious. More conscious in a way when you did have... Someone did get out a camera. Mm -hmm. It's very different. I mean, it's quite a different world in a way with the phone. And you can see the image immediately. Which now. is unfortunate. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's one of my great quotes. I think we're erasing the unconscious of the photograph when we... Because we choose the nice ones. Yeah. It's the end of search for the ideal, which, which is a false premise anyway. Oh, it looks so lovely like this. <coughs> No, you yeah. it's become damaging, I think. Sorry? It's very damaging, because you can't, there is no ideal. You can't reach him. So in a way, there's something quite sweet and innocent about these. Although I can tell you the story behind any of these pictures. You can. can you well, yeah, because I've you listened to Joe, haven't I? It, yeah. Well, yes, this one here, because we actually worked on it. Um, it's a picture of, is this Jo as a yeah, child? Yeah, it's Jo. Jo as a child. This is um, 1945 underneath it. Yeah, and she was born in 37, um, I think. Oh, no, 35. 34 she was born. Oh, so the story behind this one is that, um, well, partly there were no pictures taken during the war, so there were no images of her at all apart from that smiley one, which is quite sweet. We like that one. But this one... She hated it because her hair's drawn back and she looks a bit stressed and she talked about being a latchkey child because both her parents are working in factories and, and she 
have to um, open the door and see that her brother was all right and kind of be taking care of other people. And she hated that image because she felt she looked very stressed. And we restaged that in a phototherapy session. And then um, without changing clothes, but just changing the story um, and how she presented herself, she became um, different members of her family and then ended up uh, portraying herself as her father just after he was... Uh, his after his wife died, Joe's mum died, and so he's really su- she as her father is kind of really sunken and in grief and very old and miserable. So just just by moving the body, just by how you present yourself to camera and how, because I was playing the role to remind her, you know, to say, you know, your your wife's died, you're abandoned, you're old, you're miserable, you know, just to get it even more into it, and then because it's the notion of phototherapy is to transform. Um, I then braided Joe's hair and, and took images to make, give an image of power and, and strength to contradict the sadness of that image. What a beautiful process. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's a very neat example of the process, really. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. After a conversation with Rosie outside the exhibition, Rosie took us in to the exhibition to the room where her works are being shown. The first of these works that we came across was Transforming the Suit, What Does a Lesbian Look Like? Part one, two, and three. These were made in 1987 by Rosie Martin in collaboration with Joe Spence. I'm just, we've arrived at Rosie's work and I'm just reading a definition by Havelock Ellis in a book, I assume, called Sexual Inversion um, from 1897, um, entitled What Do Lesbians Look Like? Shall I read the description? When they still retain female garments, these usually show some traits of masculine simplicity, and there is nearly always a disdain for the pretty feminine artifices of the toilette. Even when this is not obvious, there are all sorts of instinctive gestures and habits which may suggest to female acquaintances the remark that such a person ought to have been a man. The brusque energetic movements, the attitude of the arms, the direct speech, the inflections of the voice, the masculine straightforwardness and sense of honour, and especially the attitude towards men, free from any suggestion either of shyness or audacity, will often suggest the underlying psychic abnormality to a keen observer. Is that gaydar? (laughs) In the habits, not only is there frequently a pronounced taste for smoking cigarettes, often found in quite feminine women, but also a decided taste and toleration for cigars. There is also a dislike and sometimes incapacity for needlework (laughs) and other domestic occupations, while there is some capacity for athletics. She shows, therefore, nothing of that sexual shyness and engaging air of weakness and dependence which are an invitation to men. Oh my God, Rosie. Yeah, well, Where did you find that? Well, I was actually doing a course on lesbian history because I take my identity very seriously. Um, oh God, I mean, can you, you just read that and you kind of know why you've got to do a piece of work on it, don't yeah. you? Yeah. It's kind of a gift in a way because it is so, it's so off the wall. And the other point was, I think he made that... Um, he did a lot of work on defining. His whole task was this definition of thing. He did a whole series where he photographed homosexual men as well from three angles. and you know, So the notion was you could identify someone from how they looked, how they presented, which was obviously a complete gift in terms of you know what, what does a lesbian look like. Um, so that got me going, that got me, that inspired me to do the work really. And also the fact, as I was saying, when we were chatting that, you know, I'd given up all my pretty clothes. Mm. And so there was actually still a notion that you had to present yourself in certain ways, albeit not as um, dogmatic as that. But um, yeah, and also, yeah, 
the alter ego, the one I mentioned, the check shirt one, you know, she is, she was. And she's probably still around. And she's going to tell you what to do, or what do we call it now? Oh, God. New words for it. But you had to be politically sound, you know. You were politically unsound if you weren't. Actually, I'll read that one out, it's good. She is the internal e- editor, thou shalt not, a harsh judge. She draws the lines about what is permissible. A stringent idealist, she tells me, you are not ideologically sound. You cannot say that, feel that. You cannot look like that. You cannot be like that. She is the part of me that disapproves of me. Well, that's really powerful. It's heavy. Really heavy. But, you know, she's the ideal feminist in a way. She's the impossible ideal at one level. She is another lesbian stereotype, though. Yeah. And she was around. I did know people like that. It wasn't me, though, but, you know, I be strident. So that was the Cheshire images, the strident one, whereas the uh, ones wearing a suit are a bit softer, maybe the way I'd have looked when I went to a club like Rackets or whatever. So still wearing the suit, but it's more relaxed. Because the other title for this is, is Transforming the Suit, What Does the Lesbian Look Like? And basically I'm wearing the same clothes, just positioning myself differently, performing differently, according to the piece and the five sections to it. I love this work. Yeah, well, we might, it, might be, um, it might be respected. I mean, the whole idea was obviously in the way that I've shot it was, was fun and performative when I did the work with Joe, but then I turned it into something that's almost museological, like how do you define this species, this odd, found, or found in, you know, like an anthrop- anthropologist might look at it. But it's that... Um, but it's funny. Social critique as well, isn't yeah. it, of yourself and how you feel judged. Oh, yeah, people. well, that text, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yes, that, that sense of constantly being judged. And then we've got the, um, I call her mother of three, because, you know, why shouldn't a lesbian have kids? Yeah, why not? But she's more hidden, because she's the mother of three, so you're not assuming. You don't make the assumptions you might do with the earlier ones. She's still a lesbian. Yeah. There's the heteronormative appearances that... Yeah. So I'm wearing a a very beautiful shirt that I made, but I'm also still wearing the suit, so, you know, it's still... It's still there, but it's it's, it's more, um, as you say, heteronormative. And I fluff my hair a bit, but it's the same. What is this? One is the um, the Madonna, the flirt, the firm, feminine female characteristic suitable for like women. So the lilies, I suppose, the lilies are sort of a, a token prop that speaks to that. Oh, it's almost Victorian, isn't it? That, you know, the sort of ah. Oh, Oh, looking so gentle. Yeah, like but, a classic, yeah. classic portrait pose. Definitely. But looking down, you know, looking, looking, um, admi- you know, like tenderly, yeah. the Madonna look, mm, that's yeah. what that face is. But then, of course, she's, she's also the flirt. She's also got good muscles, and, yeah, she can stand like a, a model, but she can also stand firm yeah. and powerful and take up all her space. So you've got... I'm playing all the time with the with each icon really each of these pieces is being playful about if you like it's set and then it and then it plays so there's an idea that's set and then I'm playing with them performatively throughout the work next Rosie took us over to the larger of the works in the room unwind the lies that bind this is work from 1988 and includes seven photos forming a joining. These are print on paper mounted on aluminium. Right, what are we looking at here? 
I don't know this work, Rosie. You don't? Mm -mm. No. How come? It's been used a lot. Yeah. Uh, no, okay. This is, uh, this is my response to clause 28, okay. which is. Will people know what clause 28 is? Was? No. no. Well, yes, probably most people do, but. Yeah, I think because I. Let's, let's describe it anyway. Well, basically, it was a piece of very restrictive legislation that was brought in by the Tory government, uh, which talked about. Um, local authorities not being allowed to promote homosexuality and not describe pretended family relationships. Um, and it was, it came in, in around the time of the AIDS crisis, so obviously it was linked to that. And also it was very punishing towards lesbians with kids. And in those days you could have your kids taken off you just for being lesbian if you were in a divorce. I mean, it was really hard times, really hard times. And um, also, I was completely shocked by the words that the um, MPs were using. So I actually got a copy of Hansard and went through and took out all the worst words that the so-called governors of this country were using to describe this group of lesbians and gays. I mean, it was horrendous. So that's things like predator, of pervert, disease, evil, sick. Um, but the words, just a phase, unnatural, it makes my flesh creep, were actually the words that my mum said to me when I came out to her. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, which was hard. And um, I came out to her quite late. I've been a lesbian already for about eight, ten years, but um, I hadn't told her because I had a sense of the way she would respond and unfortunately I was right um, and I put the two together which was both the, the, the view from outside if you like the view from um, the lawmakers in this country and, and indeed my mother's response I made this piece of work um, in a state of anger but also because I wanted to make clear to the audience what it was like to have these pejorative terms stuck on you. So I'm bound in, I'm bound in, in um, bandage. Joe bound me in this bandage so that I can't move, I can't, I can't speak, I'm blinded, I'm, I'm silenced and I'm trapped by all these words. And it's very much really another way of taking it is looking at projective identification, the way people will put on others mm. the bits of themselves they can't cope with. Yeah. So actually, although it's very much about Clause 28 and it's very much about how it felt to be a lesbian in that context, or indeed how it would have felt to be a gay man in that context, you could see as how it feels to be any group that is despised or yeah. um, rejected in our society. Yeah. And it's, it's hugely strong because it's, it's personal... Social and political. And political. Yeah, it's all three. <laughs> yeah. So this one really does take all the boxes. And it comes out of personal experience, it's a performance, um, but you know, it's got a very theoretical framework to it. And obviously, you don't just stay there because this is phototherapy, you break out of it. So that I've included the smaller image of me escaping from it, even though this, right. of course, the huge one, the life size one, is the, is the iconic image. I, I did want to show it with the notion that you could escape from it. Yeah. You could struggle and you could reclaim yourself. So the, the small one is it's I'm incredibly am important in the process me. of struggling out of it. But this is the one that, it was actually used on the front cover of 10 I mean, It's been used a lot, but um, like the other work, it was um, a friend of mine was looking after it because I, I took this and the, what does the lesbian look like to the States and showed it there and left it there in the hope it would be shown again and I haven't seen it for 30 years. Oh. <laughs> so it was quite nice to see it again. Yeah, what did it feel like <laughs> to have it Wow, back? amazing. And it was really hard to, um, to hang it because it's all, it's overlapping single images. Um, jo did a good job. She, 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 photographed it so she was straight on to all the words so that you could read it not just 
as a one-off portrait, but as a joiner. Of course, it was really hard to actually hang. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, that's how I showed it. And I wanted it to have that kind of agitprop feel about it. So you put it in a frame, it loses some of that directness. It should look like something that's just been stuck on a wall. Yeah. Is it possible that I have seen parts of that image? Or is it, has it always been shown as one? Um, possibly the head. Because it's familiar to me, but not the whole thing. Oh. So I wonder if that's why. I don't know. Um, well, it was shown a lot at the time, but uh, obviously the time is a long time ago. 1988. I like those, um, the size of it. It's like really yeah, it's great. Size. It's, yeah. it's body's human size, yeah. It's, it's very confronting as well. Tiny, yeah. yeah. No, it needs to be life size. It needs to be big. And, you know, I, I made this for a show called The Lesbian Gaze, which was part of um, Spectrum, which was a women's photography event and women's work was being shown all over well not just London all over the country and um, I made them as well, each of those was hand printed so they were nice prints but I just stuck them up with um, double sided serotype um, but I had no funding for it I just made it out of anger <laughs> that wasn't something I was going to wait for I just had to do it and do it when I did it yeah I did quite a lot of work around Clause 28, but this is the strongest piece. You know, it felt, it felt necessary, it felt important. You know, you've got all this anger and frustration, so it, it meant, for me, it was useful to make something that I hoped would engage an audience who weren't necessarily oh, lesbian or gay. They weren't the targets of, of this horrendous attitude, but to try and speak to other people about what it might be like to be treated in that way. Yeah. Which it does very powerfully. Yeah. I'm always, always wondering how this was mounted and how it was printed. Like, I'm, I'm just, as if you always presented it that way, like sectioned in this way. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Print, yeah. And, uh, printed yeah. on aluminium. This was Not this. printed on aluminium, because they're no funding, babe. So I, they were like, very good handprints but just stuck on the wall with double sided sellotape and cut so that the words work because obviously as a joiner you have to make it work you well I knew it worked so uh, then, I, then I just had it printed but it was done in a hurry as I said because it was a response was yeah, yeah. Was uh, and there was an opportunity to, to, yeah. to show it because of yeah. spectrum but yeah. it, was that, it was that year it was you know a month or so when they were still doing the debate so it was current you know, you can't wait for a piece like that. It, it, it's of its time, yeah. of its moment. Thank you so much, Rosie. I'm very aware of how much time we've taken of yours, and you <laughs> oh, must be gasping really for good. a drink of water as well. No, it's been oh. great. I've really enjoyed it. I hope it's been useful. Oh, it's been fantastic. Been Thank you. It's just so lovely to meet you. Yeah. But obviously, there's loads more work we haven't talked about. And I'm, or visiting yeah. ageing again, visiting and ageing outrageous again. ages with outrageous. Kate Goodrich. That's it. Yeah, it's very important. I always mention my collaborators because yeah. they're key, yeah. and it's a collaborative so practice. And we've talked about the work in the house. And the oh, mum's housework. Yeah. Yeah. Mum's housework. Yes. I yeah. call. What do I call it? Um, what do I call it now? Too close to home. Too close to home. Yeah. Mm, great title. Well, I was saying all this work. You know, it's too close to home. <gasps> That's what it is, it's too close to home because it's too close, you know, because yeah. it's, it's so painful. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I like witty titles. That works on your website though, isn't it? I was able to see it. That work is actually on my ancient website, which I haven't done anything to for about 15 years. I'm very ashamed of my website. Website, uh, yeah, I've got several that are some of them out of date as well <laughs> well there is a website for outrageous ages and there is a website for gravity gravitas which is the work with verity wellstead but i really don't have the time or energy to make websites i'm not interested i'm interested in making work so if we want to see sorry your, my recent work there's a vimeo to see some videos and yeah. there's the references i just gave you yeah so we'll make sure we have the link to yeah the vimeo. I'll, I'll send you those yeah. no problem but and I'm Rosie Martin 5 on Instagram, but I'm not really 
I don't really belong to that generation. Okay. I mean, it's just too tiresome. And also, do you really want to know what I had for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you want to tell us. <laughs> well, when I, went, when I went around Finland with a friend, which was amazing, went way up and even swam in the Arctic Ocean, very important. Um, it, was, it was fun swimming. It was cold, of yeah. course. Um, on that trip, I think we photographed every meal. Well, that was before Instagram, so it was quite fun to do that. Yeah. Now, of course, everyone's doing it, and it's really boring. I wouldn't dream of doing it now. Mm. Fair. Right. So, thank you, Rosie. Thank you. You've been listening to the Woman Up podcast. To find more of our episodes, subscribe via any of the usual podcasting platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, and more. For captioned episodes, please visit the Woman Up YouTube channel. And for news and updates, follow us on Instagram at woman.up.podcast. Mm-hmm.